Amen and amen. It's one of my favorite praise songs, I think. Just, uh, it's good to see you this morning. I think some folks thought it was going to rain, got sunshined out, didn't we? So, <laughs> it's funny, I was looking at my temperature on the gauge in my car, it tells the outdoor temperature, and it said it was 79. Then I got out, it felt like 100. So, welcome to Houston. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, the last couple of weeks we've been doing a series of messages on having a pure conscience and the importance of that in our life to having victory and having freedom in our lives so that there's not all these past accusations of Satan in our life and keeping our conscience clear and, you know, having that attitude that there's not anybody in the world that I've offended. I have not yet sought to seek to make it right. Uh, and the reason we walk so many times in our Christian life without real joy and victory is because we haven't dealt with those things that are looming around like cobwebs on our spiritual life that need to be dealt with. And so it's been interesting as we've gone through that to see people's responses. And But even heard some say, well, you know, I've dealt with my conscience. But one of the things you said in that series of messages was that one of the reasons many times we don't experience real victory in our Christian life and walk is because of that. It is one of the reasons, but not the only reason. Sometimes we don't experience victory because we think victory is a feeling. But understand victory doesn't have anything to do with your feelings. Uh, your joy doesn't have a lot to do with feelings, but we don't always understand it and know that. So I want to lead us to a passage of Scripture for the next two Sundays, this and next Sunday, maybe a third we'll see, that just kind of follows up and tr dovetails on that message why, why we, we get those situations sometimes we're not experienced what we think ought to be the experience of victory or joy in our life and see what the Scripture has to say about it. In fact, the, the message is entitled, you know, uh, Lessons from the Wilderness because there are times in our Christian walk in life when we do go through wilderness experience. It seems like that uh, we've dealt with the things we need to deal with in our life. There's, you know, as far as we know, we use the terminology, we're fessed up. We confess the things that are in my heart and life that were wrong. I've dealt with the issues that I know are not right, but yet I'm going through a time and a period in my life where it just seems that, you know, this is the valley. This is not the mountaintop experience. It just seems like there's just deadness of, of soul. It's like it's midnight of the soul. It's like there, I'm in, uh, I have questions that there don't seem to be answers from. I'm facing a difficult crisis or experience in my life. You know, and it's, it's this terrible wilderness I'm going through. I personally believe that the Bible makes it very clear to us if we pay attention that God wants us to walk through some of these times in our life so we can learn some very important truth about him and our walk and our relationship to him. And there's some words in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that Moses and the Lord is speaking to, to the people and their words to the nation of Israel that they need to learn some significant lessons from what they've been experiencing. And all too often we go through life experiences and we don't learn anything. You've heard the illustration about well, always well learn from the mistakes. All too often we don't learn from our mistakes. And God's trying to speak to us and we're just not listening. And so we continue to go through difficult situations. Well, I believe also that with all these different situations that we may have to experience in our life, that with every difficult situation, that there carries with that situation the possibility of an equal are an even greater benefit that the Lord is trying to bring to my life and to my life experience from that difficult situation. And there has to be, I think, a willingness on our part to honestly survey and look at where we are, what's going on in our life, the experience that we're, we're, we're experiencing in the, even the time, and learn from those times, or whether it's the testings or the trials or even the failures, that we learn from those times. And if we don't learn from those situations of our life, then certainly we are not going to receive any of the benefit that God wanted to bring in those situations in our life. So let's look in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to read it from the King James. I think that's in the New American Standard that's on, on the wall, or it might not be. I'm not sure. It says, anyway, all the commandments which I've commanded this day shall observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which Jehovah swore unto your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which Jehovah thy God hath led thee these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and he allowed you or suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by everything or every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Jehovah God doth man live. 
Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, nor did your feet swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chased his son, so the Lord will chasten you. In other words, he's saying, I'm dealing with you as your father. And, I, and when he uses the word chasten here, it's a broader term in the Hebrew means it has to do with instruction. Not just, a lot of times we think of discipline or chastening as a whipping, you know, getting punished for something. But the biblical idea of chastening and the biblical idea of discipline is always first and foremost instruction from the teacher, example from the teacher, and in, in putting that example and in putting those truths and those instructions into the young person's mind, the student's mind, whoever it might be, for us as God's children. God is always teaching us, in other words. God is always instructing us. God is always doing something in our life to draw us closer to him so that we might experience our love relationship on the level that he desires it. But I don't think most Christians enjoy that kind of level of fellowship. I think all too often, I know that it's been the story of my life at different times, I felt like, well, God's just mad at me. You ever feel like God's just always mad at you? I'm just, I just keep stumbling, I keep messing up, so God's just always mad at me? That, that's, that's a place that the devil would love you to live. And you've got to avoid falling into that. One, God's not mad at you, all right? Even when you sin, you grieve the Holy Spirit, all right? And the Father will correct that in your life. But the Father has great high hopes for you. The Bible says the Father will complete in you that which he began until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to happen. In fact, he's telling us here in these verses, he says, listen, you need to understand that all these words and these instructions and the discipline, even the chastening, it's for a reason. He said that you might live. That you might live. You really live. Most people, you know, they don't know what that's all about. But he said, I want you to really experience life and that you might multiply for our Christian life, it's, it's like this. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. But it doesn't stop here. God said, I want you to express that life to other people because life always brings forth life so other people can come to Christ as well. Other lives can be changed. God said, listen, I'm giving you all this instruction and leading you into these experiences so you can really experience the fullness of life and you can make a difference in the world around you. And then he says, and you can possess the land. Now, for the children of Israel, the possession of the land had to do with them going in and conquering the land. For us, as a New Testament illustration, it serves in this, in this regard that that land represents a life of victory and overcoming. We have enemies in the land. We have the world, amen. We got the flesh, amen. And who's that other enemy? The devil, all right. So we have these three enemies that we fight. And God said, listen, I want you to know how to have victory in your life. So I'm instructing you and I'm teaching you and I'm leading you through certain experiences in your life so you can learn that. So you can have, I can have you fullness and you can have the life and you can make a difference in other people's lives and you don't have to be beat up by the world. You're the overcomer. You're not to be overcome by this world situation. You're the ones who are to be bearing forth in victory. But all too often when we come to these difficult times in our life, we feel like God's mad at us or God's left us or God's abandoned us for whatever reason. You know, because the preacher said it's all about, you know, prosperity and blessings and success and abundance. And we forget that, hey, what the Bible's teaching us about prosperity is not what the world means by it. You know, what God's definition of abundance is not by the world's definition of it. It has to do with fullness of life and fullness of living and satisfaction with life. And so we go through experiences when we ought to be going through these problems or experiences and learning what that really means for us in that situation, or we kind of sit back, oh, things are bad, things are horrible, I just ain't laughing, why is God mad at me, why am I having to go through this, and we just miss completely what the Lord is up to. This is this quote by George Matheson I thought was pretty good, I put it up on the screen for you. He says, my God, I have never thanked thee for my thorns. I have thanked thee a thousand times for my roses, but not once for my thorns. I've been looking forward to a world where I should get compensation for my cross, but I never thought of my cross itself as a present glory. Teach me the glory of my cross. Teach me the value of my thorn. Show me that I've climbed to thee by the path of pain. And show me that my tears have made my rainbows. What's the old Andre Crouch song? If I'd never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. What's he saying? It's in the midst of my problems, and this is what he's saying here, that I experienced the power of God and the glory of God and the grace of God. And had I not been in those circumstances nor in those situations, I wouldn't have experienced God's 
relief and God's mercy and God's grace. He says, so teach me, Lord, to thank thee as the apostle, but in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What's the will of God? That I learn how to be thankful. So there's a couple of verses in here that really bear down on what we need to learn in those situations of crisis or difficulty or times when it just seems to be absolutely no joy in, in the atmosphere of my spiritual walk in life because God is teaching me greater things. I think the key phrase is found in verse 2 when he says to them, you shall remember the way which I led thee. Now the way is, that particular terminology is, is, the, is a Greek word, a uh, Hebrew word, it, it's direct and it has to do with you know, the journey and you know, a, a path. It could also mean the manner in which you did something. Ultimately, it's the course of life. But what the Lord is trying to say is, it's not, that, it's not like this. I want you to remember the way. In other words, you came, you came out of you know, Cairo <laughs> and you got up to the Dead Sea down there around your lot. And remember, you crossed there. And so you crossed there. When you came out on the other side, remember, you went up to Mount Sinai and you went around that a few times and you went across the desert these 40 years. And then I led you back to the east for a while. He's not saying remember the way in that regard. Like, you know, I got my GPS coordinates. In fact, He's not trying, want you to remember the way so you can find the way back to Egypt. All right? He'd like you to forget that direction path. But he's talking about the manner and the way in which he led you. In other words, how does God handle my life? How does God deal with me? How is God working in my life? And, and, and if, I, if I fail to understand that, then I fail to understand who God is ultimately. And I'm just, I'm just, well, it's like the children of Israel. When David wrote about their experiences in the wilderness, David the psalmist said, Lord, the children of Israel saw thy wondrous works, but Moses knew thy way. Moses knew the ways of God. And I think that's part of what he's saying here. We need to understand how God works in our life. And if we fail to understand how God works in our life, then we'll live with that attitude of disappointment many times. We'll add, live with the attitude with God's mad at me or live with the attitude of what have I done now? It's important to know if there is sin in your life, you don't have to go guessing around about it. The Holy Spirit makes it clear to you. All right? And you can deal with that. So if after that and you've dealt with that and you're walking in grace, it doesn't mean that you're going to be with that complex situations. <laughs> and difficult trials and confrontations on all different kinds of hands. But what we need to do is step back for a moment and say, hey, God, you're up to something in my life. There's a thing that you're doing in my life because I know your ways. You love me and you've given me your word and you've given me your promises and you've given me a victory. So how am I going to express that in the manner of life that I have right now? What am I going to do? Lessons. In the process, you shall remember the world. But there, there's really four lessons that I want to bring out of this today, and I'm going to bring two of them this morning. I'll bring the next two next Sunday, so don't forget what I preached about between now and next Sunday, okay? I know some of you thought I was going to talk about space this morning. <laughs> I'm just trying to get across the message that my sermons are out of this world. <laughs> this is promotion for Vacation Bible School, all right? <laughs> so, be praying for our VBS team. But listen to what he says as he talks about learning his ways. And lesson number one here, as I believe, is, is that, hey, it, it has to do with the sufficiency of God. That God is ultimately everything that we need. All right? And this was a lesson that they were going to have to learn here. He says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you. All right? Testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you keep his commandments or not. But I want to focus in on this word that he might humble you. And what does that mean? The contemporary English version uses a different translation here, but I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But I thought I'd share this quote. There is nothing quite so dead as a self-centered man, a man who holds himself up as a self-made success and measures himself by himself and is pleased with the result. Someone says, the person who's wrapped up in himself comprises the smallest package known to mankind. <laughs> if it's all about you and if your life, if this is your kind of your life, it's just, it's just all about a self-centered life. And this is the way a lot of people live their life. A lot of Christians live their life this way. You know, it's like everything that's happening right here is all that's important. And everything really revolves around me. Am I happy? You know, and, and, and others are here to make me happy. And, and it's important that God arranges my circumstances properly so that I can be happy. And, you know, it, 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 and I've got to arrange my circumstances as much within my power to do to make me happy. And if certainly God's not making me happy, then something's wrong. And pride really is at the root of all that. In that verse when he said the Lord led you all this way that he might humble you. Here's what it puts it from the contemporary English version. Do not forget how the Lord your God has led you through the desert for the past 40 years. All right? You need to learn something. 
He wanted to know and to, he wanted to find out if you truly were willing to obey him in case was, and depend on him. Now I'll deal with the first part of that in a, in a moment. But he says, God is trying to teach you a lesson on how to depend upon him. If you want the simplest definition for humility, as far as the Christian is concerned, this is it. God dependency. That I trust in the sufficiency of my heavenly father that I believe God is able, that I know God is going to meet my need. And he said, listen, look over your shoulders. Did not I feed you the past 40 years? I fed you miracle food, man. You, you didn't even know what that was. And your fathers didn't know what that was. Some you never, and I provided for you. He said, your feet didn't swell. Your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothes didn't wear out. You know, he, he just, he, he lives all, look at everything I've done for you. You should come to the place in your life to realize that you, your life really does depend upon me. What is that? You should be humble. You should live with an attitude that my life it really surface, focuses on the, the Father. But in the world that we're living today, and we've called it the age of narcissism, it's really all about you. And getting everybody to, to meet your need and everybody to make you happy. And the church is there to make you happy. And the boss is there to make you happy. And the, the, you know, the, the traffic is there to make you happy. And, and the weather is there to make you happy. And when all these things don't line up and make you happy, then the world has gone wrong and you're not happy. And when you're not happy, nobody else usually is happy around you. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a life really just of this, this, this dead person we talked about, this self-centered person who puts himself at the center of his life and everybody's there, you know, if I'm not happy, then just forget you, I'll just do what I want and live my life. Pride is at the core. Pride is at the very core of most every sin we commit ultimately. Pride is what eliminates our need for God. Pride is what eliminates our trust in our heavenly father. Pride is what encourages our disobedience to God. It is pride that erodes our fellowship with God. Constantly in, in combat with the Spirit of God in our life. And all too often we just listen to self and what we want instead of what the Holy Spirit is whispering in our heart and mind. It's what we want. Back in, uh, I've been, we, you know, we've been in Proverbs and been both campuses back and forth. In Proverbs 22, there's a great proverb. I brought it up last week. And it made a point of what I read recently about what sociologists tell us. Sociologists in our culture tell us that what people want more than anything else is, uh, or well, it gets down to this, it's money, honor, and life. All right, we go back to that other slide. If these are what people want. Money, I'd, I'd like to have some, some cash, all right. I'll be happy. What else do I want? You know, I, I also want, not only to have money, I want honor. I want respect. Some put it as fame, even. What else do you want? Man, I just want to live. I really want a good, good life. I want a good life. I don't want all these problems. Listen to what Paul says about each of these as you look at his letters. In one place, he says, you know, concerning money and things, I count everything as loss, that I might know Christ. He says, Christ is far, far more important than more money. But that's not the way people live their lives today. A lot of Christians think that money is more important than more Christ. Amen? And then, but not only that, he said, the second thing that men require here is, is honor. What, what does Paul say about that? You know, I'm the least of the apostles. And he's constantly encouraging through his letters to live a life of dependence upon God, not upon ourselves, but dependence upon the Lord and to put aside our, our, our old flesh. About life, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me. I'm living the Jesus life. I'm living the Christ life. My life is centered in him now and what his will is, not what my will is and not what I want. But today, I think in our culture, especially in church culture, we have this, this we have Jesus and we have me and I'm just about as equal as Jesus in, in regard to, to getting things done and what I want in life. In fact, what I'm praying to Jesus about is what I want, not what he wants. And what I'm asking Jesus for most of the time is what I want and not what he wants. I'm asking God to take away a situation. And God said, I put that situation there to show you that, hey, there's another life to be lived. But I'm going to keep praying my will instead of thy will. What I want versus what God wants. How I'd like it instead of how God wants it. And it's a constant, difficult, hard way to live your life. But let me tell you what Proverbs says about this. As I preached out this in Proverbs, it comes out in chapter 22, verse 4. when he says, by humility... And the fear of the Lord are what? Riches, honor, and life. 
Isn't it interesting? The sociologist and the contemporary culture we live in tells us the three things that meant most. God says, I will provide those for you, but you're not going to find it in yourself, and you're not going to find it in money, and you're not going to find it in fame. You're going to find it by honoring me. I'll meet your needs. I'll be your God. I'll supply life greater than you've ever experienced in your life. I'll give you the fullness of life that you want. But God comes first, not self. And God is telling these people, you've gone through these 40 years of experience to teach you that self's not going to give you anything you need and that what you need is humility, which is a dependence upon the sufficiency of your heavenly father. Can we get back to that in our life where I can really say, you know, I really am depending upon the sufficiency of my father. You know, we're so busy trying to be something and be somebody in the culture we live in because everything is geared that way. Maybe we just need to learn, you know, quit trying to get our BS degree and get our BN degree and be nothing for a while. And say, God, would you be glorified in my life? Now, I know we, 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 we say all the right things. Well, yeah, I trust the Lord, and I'm humble, and I'm really dependent upon the Lord. And, you know, I mean, let me ask you a question to kind of get to the bottom of that and help you resolve that, the truth of that statement in our own lives. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting, I'm, yes, I trust the Lord for my sustenance. I trust the Lord for my life. I, I'm just trusting God for everything. Okay, let's just present a situation here. What if God died tonight? Now, don't raise your hand. I know he's not going to, okay? But what if he did? How would that affect your life? How would that affect your plans? How would that affect your finances? How would that affect your giving? How would that affect anything? What would change in your life today? I think that's a good question. We know it's an absurd question from one, one, one standpoint, but the, the idea is that I think our humility has to be recognized as a is a is an is a is a is a recognition to that says, God, you're, you're truly my source of living. And I'm coming to you daily and recognizing you as my source of life and my source of living, or I'm just taking my life upon myself and taking the bumps and bruises and just kind of navigating myself through the storm to the best of my abilities. No, that's not the way that God called us to live. He called us to cast our cares upon him and lay our life before him and look to him for those things that we need most in life. Will we trust the Lord? Here's what he says here in verse 3. I humbled you. I got you to the place where you had to realize that you weren't the answer to your problems. You're not the answers to your situation. You're not the, you're not the answer. You need me. And that's one of the greatest lessons you'll ever come to, that you need God. And the world says, well, you don't need anybody but yourself. No, that won't get you through. You need God. Here's what Jeremiah, and I love the way Jeremiah puts it here. When, when he speaks in Jeremiah chapter 10, he says, Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. You know what does that mean? He said, God, you gave man legs, but he didn't know what to do with them <laughs> because of his sin nature. Until he has you in charge of his life, you know, he'll continue to make bad decisions. But the, remember what it says in Proverbs, there is a way which seems right unto man. A way to walk, a way to live, a way to conduct your life, but it's not right. There's a lot of ways every day that come up in our mind that says, here's how you handle that situation. But it doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's going to lead to life. It's not in man to direct his own steps. So what does a man do? God, I got these legs, but you're going to tell me where to go. You're going to have to direct my walk and my path and the course of my life. That's when we get to that place and I'm just going to be humble before God and I'm going to let him do what he wants to do. Instead, what do we do many times? We're just, we don't like what's out in front of us. We're complaining, God, would you just change that person, change that situation, or maybe just kill them? <laughs> wouldn't say that loud, right? Just get rid of that. In a book by uh, Lisa Beamer, who was the daughter of... Uh, the guy, I remember at 9-11, was on the, the one flight that, that, uh, that crashed out in the fields because they were turning the plane around to go into Washington and crash it in the White House, supposedly, and that was the plan on the terrorist mines on 9-11. And, and uh, this man, who was famous for the quote, let's roll, to the man who, on the plane to attack the terrorists to keep them from completing their goal, and they brought that plane down. His daughter was, wrote a book called The Miracle of God's Presence, and she captures this, what I'm trying to say, I think, very, very eloquently, as she reflects on the loss of her dad, a situation that she probably rather had to go a different way. She said, slowly, I began to understand that the plans that God has for us don't just include good things, but they include the whole array of human events, the prospering, 
that God talks about in Jeremiah. We always use that verse, but I have no plans that have to prosper your blessing. He said the prospering that God talks about in the book of Jeremiah is often the outcoming of a bad event. I remember my mom saying that many people look for miracles, things that in their human mind will fix a difficult situation. Many miracles, however, she says, are not, are not a change to the normal course of human events. They're found in God's ability and desire to sustain and nurture people even through the worst of situations. Somewhere along the way, she states, I stopped demanding that God fix the problems in my life and started being thankful for his presence as I endured them. In other words, I've come to the place not trying to use God to manipulate my circumstances all the time, but to realize that God is teaching us something far greater and more valuable, more important than just peace in the midst of the storm. God's teaching me life lessons that I need to learn, and the greatest one of all is what God is telling these people. It's taken me 40 years to get you people to the place to realize that you need me. And how often do we get to that place and I have to realize, I, I just need to stop and recognize the fact I need God. And then live my life like I'm truly dependent upon him for my life. The second lesson here we, we would learn from this is what we call, not the first, the first member is, is that God's sufficient. Now is this, the lesson of self-revelation. Because he says in verse 2, he says, he says, you should remember the way which the Lord God led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you and catch these words, testing you nor, to know what was in your heart, whether you keep his commandments or not. Now, this is not saying God is, like, that God is, uh, God put you in a situation to see if you'd really serve him. Because that's what it sounds like, right? But the real literal rendering of this is that God put you in this situation so you would see what was in your heart. Why? Because God knows what's in your heart. Remember when the Pharisees and the scribes are kind of mumbling in the background and Jesus is teaching and he rebukes them because he knew their heart and he knew their thoughts? God knows your heart. God knows your thoughts. God sees all that that goes on inside our, this, this veiled flesh and this body. He sees what's really going on in your mind today. And what he's saying here, I want you to see what's going on. I want you to see what's going on. I want you to get a real good picture. I think all too often we have a, a, an overestimated opinion of ourselves. It's like the woman who came to the pastor, you know, she said, she, she says, uh, I, I need an appointment with the pastor. And she's this young woman and she, she sees the pastor at church and says, I've really got to meet with you. Uh, I've become aware of a, a particular sin in my life that I, I, I just don't think I can control. So he took her off to the side there in the lobby. He said, well, Mary, what is it? And she said, well, every time I come to church, I start looking around everybody in the church and I realize that I'm the prettiest woman in the church. You know, I'm just out. I'm just more beautiful than, than, than nobody else compares in, in the fellowship with my beauty. And I just don't know what I can do about that. It's just, you know, and the pastor replied, well, Mary, that's not a sin. That's just a mistake. <laughs> Sometimes we need a little of the truth, amen? It comes through. You know, what we think of ourselves, though, many times a completely different picture of what we truly are. It's like two different things. But it's when we get into the more wilderness areas of our life and the difficult times of our life that we really start seeing what we are. I mean, just let the toast burn today. You'll see just a little bit of what you are. Let traffic back up when you're trying to get someplace. Let, let someone offend you. Let someone hurt you. All of a sudden, this, these things start boiling up in us, don't they? Amen? These things can bubble up real fast. And we, all of a sudden, we say, oh, but if we'll take a moment to look at that, is that what we really want? You know? Is that what we really want to see in our lives? And so God allows, he says, I've led you this way so you could, you could see through this journey and discover through this process there's some things about you that you need to see. Because many times what we think about ourselves and what we see, you know, it's in that wilderness that we really discover who we are. It, it has a tendency in crisis and in circumstances to isolate our real need and what's really going on in our life and who we're really following. And all of a sudden it may show up that we're not really following the Lord. It's like you've heard me use the illustration before about the guy who goes to the doctor and the doctor examines his heard you're, you know, you've got, you've got a, just a common cold. He says, well, I'm miserable. I don't like it. He says, well, there's not a lot we can do for the common cold. There's no cure for it. Hey, but I tell you what, don't, do, don't take anything and just let, let, let this thing advance to pneumonia. Then I got some stuff I can give you. 
Maybe we need to let our crisis go ahead and go all the way to the end to see, hey, what the real problem is, is ourself. And there's antidote for that. It's called the cross of Christ. It's called the blood of Jesus Christ. It's called a new life in Christ. Therein lies the antidote, amen? I think we come to the place, and this is what the apostles teach us, we said to live as Christ and to die as gain. We realize, hey, without Jesus really in charge of my heart and my life and my mind, I'm a mess. I'll make a mess. I'll create a mess. I'll be a mess. I'll, I can't really do anything worthwhile and eternal and redemptive if I'm left to handle my situations by myself. And I love the way the Lord deals with them here because obviously, you know, he wants them to, to remember their past. Now, Paul said, you know, I count all those things that, you know, they're behind me. But I think he wants to, them to see very clearly his love for them, amen, that, that they've been going through this, this difficulty and the way he's been dealing with them is, has been in a testing process. They've exposed themselves in a training process to make the right decisions, to come finally to the Jordan, to cross over, and to do what needs to be done, to trust him in that moment. All that's led up to that moment so they'd have the faith to go in and now live and possess the land. We go through what we go through so we can truly experience victory in our walk in life. Now, when Paul says, I... I you know, I, I, don't th I don't focus on the past anymore. I forget those things that are behind me. He's not talking about the experiences of the lessons he's learned with God. He's talking about personal problems, personal failures, personal issues, because we are encouraged often to remember, as David put it, the mighty works of our God. We remember, we recall that in that failure, we saw the grace of God. Don't go back and recall the failure by itself. I remember God delivered me. I remember God forgave me. I remember that God did a work in my heart. God gave me the strength. God gave me what I need. I, I'm alive today. I got through it. You lived. You didn't think you would. You didn't think it'd get any worse than what it but you got through it by the grace of God. And so he said to those people, hey, look over your shoulder. You didn't die. Your shoes didn't even wear out. I fed you with a meat and a meal that you'd never had before in your life. I took care of you. I'll take care of you the rest of the way. So remember, I loved you and I'm not going to stop it. I think it's the same God wants us to remember as well. What, what is this passage in, 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 that he gives us? We are confident of this very thing, it tells the Philippians, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, how can I be confident of this very thing? Two reasons. One, because God promised it, right? Two is, I've experienced it. Well, another passage where the apostle says, I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. In other words, he said, God, I, 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 know, I'm per, I know it because I believe the truth, and I'm persuaded because I've experienced the truth. And what's God saying? To God so I've shown you how much I love you. Is that not enough? How often do I have to remind you how much I care? And you're sitting here worried that I've, that I've abandoned you? Or you think that I've forgotten you? Or you don't think I'm aware of what you're going through? This world is filled with sin and plagued with injustice and plagued with ungodliness. But in the midst of all this, God says, I'm going to get you through this mess. He said, I want you to remember who led you to this place that you're at today. Ain't that true for us? We can look back and see all that the Lord has done for us in the past. I am, it blows me away to go back as old as I am and remember all that God's done for me and to think, boy, how stupid can I be to forget that so often and just go off and respond like my flesh wants to respond. And then the NIV says, I want you to remember, because he says, the whole way that I led you. The New American Standard says, I want you to remember all the way. Can you remember God's been faithful to us? Remember that God's been righteous to us and God has manifested his love to us. You say, well, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. Hey, God still delivered you. God's still doing a work in you. God's still committed to you. I can't account for other people's failures. I can only account for my faithfulness to God. Will I be faithful? I can't account for other people's stupidity. I mean, I can count for my stupidity. All right? I can't account for people's issues. But I can account for my issues. I can't change you. God can change you. You can't change me. God can change me. So we focus on our heart and our life so that I am realizing one, one lesson, one here. I discover that God is able and I discover first lesson of this, that this is that, that God is sufficient for whatever it be. What the apostle right here in Romans 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God before us, who's against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? The things that we need, the things that will get us through, the things that will sustain us, the things that will liberate us. God gave his son for you. You don't think he's going to take care of you the rest of the way? So maybe we should spend less time in complaining and more time in praising and demonstrating our trust in the sufficiency of God. You got us through. You're getting us through. We're going to get through this. And I love it when he says, what shall we say to these things? Go back and look at the list. He's talking about everything you can go through, heaven and hell and demons and problems and turmoils and strife and tribulations and struggles, opposition. Remember, he says, I loved you enough to sacrifice my son for you. I got you covered. I'm going to get you through this. Hallelujah. The second lesson we talked about was the lesson of self-revelation. They work hand in hand. When we discover the sufficiency of God, we abandon the hope of saving ourselves, And we realize that our hope and our strength is from the Lord. And we start living our lives from that position, reminding ourselves, encouraging ourselves in that place and moving forward from that place. So I don't know what your wilderness situation might be today, even, but you should take heart and you should be encouraged because you have a loving father who is committed to you 110%. It's going to get you through it. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed this morning.